cloud. Okay, hello and welcome to the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. Today we've got Vitalik is going to talk about account abstraction. So Vitalik, please introduce mm -hmm. yourself. Um, you know, you make no, you know, you would assume that everyone would know who you are in the Ethereum ecosystem, but there are a lot of new people, so you never know. So please introduce yourself. Great. Uh, so I'm Vitalik. I'm the uh, founder of the uh, Ethereum project. I've uh, also been, well, recently doing a lot of uh, a kind of research and work on Ethereum scaling things, uh, some uh, eth um, Ethereum 2.0 proof of stake, just all of the different directions of uh, trying to push the uh, Ethereum protocol forward. And, and I guess definitely happy to be talking about account, uh, account abstraction today. Thank you. That's, um, yeah, thank you. And th thank you again for coming along and doing the talk. Um, so please um, share your slides. Okay, uh, one second. Uh, yeah. um, oh, sorry, I yeah, just uh, will get those out. I wasn't sure if I'd be sharing from my own or sharing from, uh, or, or if there would be that big, uh, um, everyone put together their 100 slide thing, but I guess, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, look, I, I, I can pro I can get them too, just a second. No, it's, it, it's fine, I almost got it. Um, events down. Uh, double click. PDF, um, not F5, share screen, uh, PDF, share. Okay, great. Uh, do people see the uh, screen? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, how many ghosts are there? Uh, Excellent. Okay. Uh, so, to kind of get right into it. Um, oh, by the way, first, um, how many minutes do I have again? Um, um, so, as many as you like, really. Sometimes okay. these talk go for one and a half hours. Sometimes they're one hour. Sometimes they're half an hour. Um, okay, that's, uh, no, that's good to know. Um, and uh, should I be expecting questions uh, coming in anywhere? Like if. Uh, um, what would you like? I mean, you can say some people are happy to um, have questions the whole way through. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to just like get questions in real time through the chat box and that way, you know, like if people ask things, I can just like go ahead and answer them right then and there. Uh, Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so great. Starting off, um, what is um, account abstraction, right? So. Basically today, in, well, so Ethereum is a programmable blockchain, right? And the thing that makes Ethereum more exciting than a lot of the platforms that came before is the fact that it is a, a programmable blockchain. But the programmability of Ethereum currently only kind of applies to specific parts of a transaction, right? So the effects of a transaction are fully programmable. So a transaction, uh, once it hits a contract, that contract can have arbitrary code and then um, that arbitrary code runs, uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that transactions can do. But the validity conditions of the transaction are fixed, right? There's basically one way to do a validity. There's, uh, well, well, basically every transaction has to have an uh, ECDSA signature, every transaction has to have a nonce, uh, and if the validity conditions are basically just step one, check the nonce, uh, step two, check the um, ECDSA signature. And if both of those are valid, then the transaction is valid. Now, the code that a transaction ends up running can have its own revert conditions, right? Like you can say things like, you know, assert this equals that. And if the assert fails, then the execution reverts. But there is an important difference between those two kinds of invalidity, um, which is that, if a transaction is fully invalid, then it's not legal for that transaction to even be included on chain, which means that that transaction is not going to be, like, pay gas, it's not going to cost anything. But if execution reverts, then the transaction is still valid and the transaction can still be included on chain, but it still pays for gas, um, and, but it, it just, the effects of the transaction, either some or all, or all of the effects um, ends up reverting. So I would argue that like, you can do a lot of things with uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of reverting, but it's not sufficient, right? And I'll talk a bit about why it's not sufficient. And so the question is, well, can we try to make 
not just the effects of a transaction, but also the validity conditions of a transaction. So the conditions that a transaction needs to pass to even be allowed to be included on chain, also programmable. So motivating use cases, right? I, uh, there's two major kinds of motivating use cases that I talk about. Uh, so one of them is uh, multi-sig wallets, right? So like personally, I've been a big fan and a big booster of uh, multi-sig wallets and uh, social key recovery and all of these ideas because you know, like I feel strongly about this idea that right current wallets are just not secure enough. Like uh, people lose their seeds or get, or get their private keys stolen or other stupid things happen all the time and people just constantly keep on losing $200,000 left and right. And often they don't even talk about it because, you know, there's this culture where if you talk about it, you know, you, you risk uh, kind of looking like an idiot. And so people end up suffer quietly, but it's still this uh, very big problem that, uh, you know, it happens to a lot of people. And uh, honestly, I, I, I don't even think, think it's like people's fault, uh, people's fault necessarily. It's like this, uh, big uh, new burden that this uh, kind of technology is, is uh, imposing on people of uh, managing one particular key and making sure that it doesn't get lost or stolen. And I think we could do much better than this, right? And multi-sig wallets uh, are one major way of uh, fixing this. Basically, instead of having one key, you would have multiple keys. Some of those keys can be held by you. Some might be held by an institution. Some might be held by your friends. Uh, social key recovery basically says you have a group of participants that have that uh, can collectively decide to uh, basically change the key of your account uh, with some delay period if you uh, end up losing your account, uh, which is also something that's uh, really valuable. Uh, but the problem with all of those alternative wallet designs is that those wallet designs uh, do not um, look, are not kind of quote natively supported, right? So with the way that a transaction works, a transaction in Ethereum always has to first to go through an externally owned account, <clears throat> which is just uh, controlled by a single ECDSA signature. Then it goes to a multi-sig and then finally it goes to uh, the recipient, right? Uh, so basically there's an entry and then a call and then another call. And there's a lot of annoyances because of this, right? Like, first of all, you always have to pay gas for this transaction. There might be some uh, kind of extra cost and some redundancy because of that. Also, uh, the, the ETH that pays for gas has to come from the first account. It can't come from the multi-sig. And so the multi-sig has to refund the gas and you have to have a balance here and a balance here. And then there's always the risk of like, well, what happens if the gas price goes up by a factor of 50? You don't have enough ETH here. Do you have to borrow some? And it gets like really stupid. Uh, so, with account abstraction, uh, future multisigs, it's a much simpler model, right? Basically, you have your account, uh, a transaction, and the transaction directly goes into the multisig. The multisig in, imposes and checks its own validity conditions. And if the validity conditions pass, then it just sends the transaction to whatever the recipient is. And so it just works exactly the same way as a single signature account works today. So that's the uh, so that's the first um, kind of motivating example uh, the second uh, major motivating uh, use case is uh, mixers right uh, generally kind of privacy solutions or uh, things uh, like uh, like tornado cash um, so the challenge here is basically that uh, if today uh, if we look at how tornado cash works right it's a smart contract where basically you deposit into the contract and then you, you get this uh, data that's called a note. And then when you withdraw the contract, you zero knowledge proof that you have some node that hasn't been included before, but the zero knowledge proof does not reveal which uh, deposit your withdrawal corresponds to. And so basically it just kind of cryptographically unlinks the uh, deposit from the withdrawal and so you have privacy. But in terms of how the thing has to be implemented, there's this big practical problem, right? Like basically, the problem is this, right? So the goal is for your withdrawal to not be tied to, uh, uh, tied on chain to your deposit. The problem is that to send any transaction, you need to pay for gas, and you have to have the gas before the ex or you have to have the gas money before the execution starts, right? Uh, and the problem, though, is that the Tornado Cash is only going to release the money after it does the execution and after it actually checks that your zero knowledge proof is correct. And so there's this cash 22 where if you have a new account, if that account doesn't have any ETH, then you have no way to withdraw unless that account already has some ETH. 
And then your only way of getting, like, and then if you actually have a way of privately getting ETH to that account without creating a link, then, well, why not just use that to do, a, uh, to do your entire transfer? So basically, it's, right, Tornado Cash has uh, this uh, problem and it solves the problem with a relayer market, right? Basically, when you make a withdrawal, your withdrawal is not a transaction, it's an off-chain message. The off-chain message gets sent to the relayer, the relayer verifies the on-chain message, the relayer fronts their own ETH uh, and they make a transaction wrapping the withdrawal and then the contract itself uh, provides a gas refund and a fee going to the relayer and then the rest of the money gets withdrawn, right? So it's this uh, much more complicated setup. It's uh, sometimes a setup that ends up failing. Like for example, if the relayer chooses a, uh, a fee that's too low, then uh, uh, often like you, do, you don't control the transaction. You don't really have a way of bumping up the fee. There's a lot of annoyances. So Tornado Cash with account abstraction is much simpler, right? It basically says you have your withdrawal transaction, you push it into the Tornado uh, contract, and then the Tornado contract verifies the SNARK, and verifying the SNARK is the validity condition. And if the validity condition passes, then some um, ETH comes out, part of it pays the gas, and part of it uh, is uh, withdrawn funds. Right, so in both of these cases, a base having a account abstraction, so basically allowing uh, the validity conditions for a transaction to just be arbitrary code execution allows both of these really important uh, types of wallets to just be considerably simplified. So the simplest kind of abstraction that we can possibly do, uh, and this is only partial kind of abstraction, right, is a signature abstraction. So- Hey Vitalik. Um, yes. Sorry to interrupt you. I might actually have a third motivated use case for you. Oh, uh, I've been working on a project for the last two years. Uh, it's called inherit.cash. Mm -hmm. So when we go back to the, uh, the first use case where you have a multi-sig wallet and you have, you know, social recovery, uh, Shamir's uh, secret algorithm, all these things that are coming out for, uh, you know, trying to recover your private key if you lost it. What about in the case where a person passes away? What, how many people do you think have passed away with active Bitcoin wallets in the last 10 years? And, mm -hmm. you know, those mm -hmm. funds might just be lost. So um, I don't want to take up too much of you guys' time. I'm just going to post some links in the uh, chat uh, mm -hmm. so you can take a look. Basically, this is um, a digital will where you can have ERC-721 assets where you can uh, assign specific beneficiaries to specific NFTs. And for your ERC-20 assets, you can assign a specific percentage of your like assets to a given beneficiary. So uh, I'll drop that in the link if, if you're interested. How account abstraction would solve problems in this space is basically um, you can't have a smart contract move native Ethereum from a, uh, a user's wallet, uh, you need you can only do this basically. This whole uh, inherit.cash system only works with ERC20 and ERC721 tokens because you can approve them to be moved. Whereas uh, because we don't have this account abstraction today in ETH 1.0, um, you know account abstraction would theoretically solve this problem um, so that you would able to um, create a digital will where your beneficiaries could. Um, withdraw native ETH, ERC-20, and ERC-721. So I'll drop a link into the chat here if anyone's interested. <laughs> Sorry, it's uh, really late here. I'm in South America and it's very dark so I can't put my camera on. Um, but I will drop those links in and if you're interested, this could certainly be your third use case. Mm -hmm. No, that's definitely a great example. Right, okay, so Signature abstraction. Um, so if we look at uh, kind of how accounts work today, right? Um, so basically all externally owned accounts have to follow this formula where like we can fit the uh, kind of different parts of the system into these categories, right? So a private key is a, a 256 bit number. Um, then we have this concept of verification data. So this is like a, a, a generalization of a public key basically. And in this case, it's your address. Um, then you have your signature, and the signature is these uh, two values, uh, kind of R and S. 
and then the verification process basically says, well, you EC recover the signature using the hash of the rest of the, uh, the transaction. Um, and then you, you take the last 20 bytes and you see whether or not it matches the uh, verification, uh, whether or not it matches your address, right? Uh, so this is basically how verification works today. Uh, so one could imagine a restricted form of abstraction that just does like a signature abstraction. And the way that it would work is basically um, we just replace each of these four categories, right? So private key would be kind of outside the scope of the consensus. It depends on the algorithm used. There could even be multiple private keys. Or there could be a lot of things. Verification data, um, instead of being an address, it would be a piece of code. And you can think of the code as just, the code is like your private key, right? And the code is just the thing that would execute the signature and verify whether or not it's valid. The signature would be arbitrary data and different code would expect signature the signatures that have different formats. And then the verification algorithm would say, execute the code with the message hash and uh, the data as input and check whether or not it returns true. So this is the kind of uh, format within which you can basically put any kind of signature verification in, right? So like if you want to do Schnorr, then the signature would be a Schnorr signature, the, the code would be a Schnorr verifier, the algorithm would check, well, if you run the Schnorr verifier on the hash and the data, then does that lead to uh, this, um, the uh, verifier return incorrect? Uh, you could do the same for BLS, you could do the same for multisigs. Um, another use, in a fun use case is uh, quantum resistant signatures. Uh, so Lamport signatures, Winternet signatures, um, and so the uh, Stark based the signatures and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things that you can fit into this format and this format actually is a fairly small change. But the problem is that there are some things that this format does not let you do, right? And the thing that this format does not let you do is it does not let you have verification conditions that depend on data that can change, right? So it does not let you have, say, social key recovery where the key can change. It does not let you have uh, something like Tornado Cache where you check uh, whether or not a nonce um, has already been um, uh, published. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can't do. So the other extreme, and this is the path that we're taking, is basically start off from the perspective of full t transaction abstraction. The idea behind a full transaction abstraction is basically a transaction is just a, a function call uh, where the sender is just like some standard uh, dummy address, right? So like think of the sender as being, say, uh, just a negative one, for example, right? Or, it could be whatever address. So basically a transaction is just a function call and then the transaction would call into some accounts that we call the target. That account would impose validity conditions if, and then that account would, if, it, if it's happy, pay the fee and, and it would do whatever else the transaction uh, wants, that, uh, wants that account to do, right? So this is the kind of consensus layer simplest way to do abstraction. But there's a lot of big challenges. Uh, so one big challenge is uh, block proposer DOS resistance, right? So this is a, an issue that the community first started ta talking about in the context of the uh, DAO soft fork. Like basically, if you have this property that, you know, you, you, you can potentially have an arbitrary amount of execution, and then at the end of ex the execution, suddenly the transaction reverts and the miner doesn't get the fee, then how can miners or block proposers uh, kind of safely uh, process transactions without the risk of them falling victim to fake transactions that do denial of service attacks. This is a uh, challenge one. It's a pretty big challenge. A uh, challenge two is network layer DOS resistance, right? So this is the same thing as block proposer DOS resistance, except instead of being whether or not to include, it's whether or not to rebroadcast. Uh, and if um, it takes uh, running the entire transaction to see whether or not you'll rebroadcast, then that's like a really huge expense. And it would just make the network you know, like basically not really be viable. A third uh, challenge is that it will need to have some new kind of transaction identifier, right? Like basically one of the nice properties that the current non-space approach guarantees is, is that transaction hashes are guaranteed to be unique uh, because the transaction hash needs to contain 
or like implicitly contain the sender and the nonce, and every sender can only have one nonce, and so a transaction hash cannot repeat, right? But in an account abstraction setup, like you could totally imagine an a, a target account that has a piece of code that actually does accept the same transaction twice. And there's even legitimate use cases for this. Like maybe after some period of time, the nonce resets, maybe the, the account just, need, just uh, needs to accept a poke and a poke would just be like a zero data transaction that just forces the account to run. A lot of things could happen, right? So one, uh, that's one way of thinking about it. And then, but then one possible solution is that miners could just adjust the nonce of the transaction as the transaction gets included, which keeps um, hashes unique, but it does mean that the transaction hashes become malleable and potentially unpredictable unless the account is deliberately set up to make them not be unpredictable, right? So this is also you know, an option. So our solution, uh, we'll focus on the first two problems uh, and then we'll talk a bit about the third at the end is that, well, so we'll establish some invariants and we'll establish some restrictions on what execution can do uh, in order to enforce those invariants. Uh, so one invariant is that we want to have a rule that says a node must execute a maximum of some amount of gas. So we'll say, for example, 400,000 gas before they know whether the transaction will pay gas or whether the transaction should be discarded. Uh, and so basically the idea here is that, you know, we, we, want, when it's, we want it to be not possible to have a transaction that just runs for many, many millions of gas. And then at the end, it's like, oops, suddenly, oops, this transaction actually isn't valid and it doesn't pay the fee. So this is the first invariant. The second invariant is that you want one gas of execution uh, to correspond to at most six gas of re-verification, right? So what this means is that if you have execution on chain, then we want to be able to make a clean mapping that says that one gas of execution on chain, like uh, in general, right, execution on chain uh, leads to uh, potentially needing to re-verify transactions because state changes that happen on chain could lead to transactions that were valid before no longer being valid because some dependency of the transaction next stop being valid, right? So we want to have as this invariant that says that one gas of on-chain execution corresponds to at most six gas of uh, re-verification. And what this means is that after each block, there would be a theoretical maximum of a 75 million gas of uh, transactions that you would need to re-verify. Now, this is a theoretical max, right? Like in practice, users are not going to be maximally greedy. Uh, in practice, if a, can know, if a miner does not manage to do all of your re-verification, they're still going to be relatively fine. Uh, so 75 million is just an upper bound. But basically, if we have this kind of cap, then we can make it much safer to actually do this uh, kind of verification, right? Um, so I guess um, I kind of just to step back a bit, right? So to kind of think about what the problem is here. The challenge is that, you know, you have these transactions and so these transactions have some validity conditions. They do some verification computation. That verification computation is going to inevitably depend on the state. Like it might depend on balances. It'll depend on nonces or some equivalent of nonces. Um, but other transactions could potentially change things that happen on state uh, in the state, right? And so after every block, you might potentially have to reprocess some part of the mempool. You definitely don't want to have to reprocess the entire mempool, which is what you would happen if there were no controls whatsoever. Um, but if we add some controls, then we can add a restriction that basically says that after every block, you only need to reprocess, but you, you know what specific transactions you would need to reprocess because you know like what dependencies uh, you're allowed to have in uh, pre, uh, uh, during verification uh, co code execution. And so there's only a limited uh, number of uh, transactions that you would have to re-verify. Great. So now we're gonna kind of specify the thing and add some rules. Uh, so a transaction is gonna be simpler. It has the form, uh, so first you have a nonce um, and we're gonna keep the nonces just to make this simpler, just to preserve a transaction hash uniqueness. Uh, then we have the uh, target and the target is just an address. And then we have data and the data is just our bytes. Um, executing a transaction is a call to the target with the given data as an input and the gas limit of the call is gonna just be the remaining gas in the block. 
when a miner attempts to process an incoming transaction, they exec start executing the call until they hit one of three conditions. Uh, first of all, um, if the execution consumes a six times N gas where N is the account spend commitment, and I'll talk about spend commitments a bit later. Basically, if the execution can consumes too much gas, then uh, at some point uh, the miner gives up and this is a fail. Um, if the execution hits a band opcode or a band call, I'll talk about what those are, that's a fail. If the execution hits the pay gas opcode, which I'll also talk about, then uh, you check what the gas price um, that the pay gas opcode declared is. If it's not sufficient, fail, and it is sufficient, then uh, pass. So uh, spend commitments. Um, basically, the idea here is that we add an opcode called, well, that we can call commit that takes an argument, um, which is just a gas amount as input, and it commits to spending at least that amount of gas uh, within the current uh, execution context. And if less gas is spent within, that, within the context um, when the execution exits the context, then the remaining gas just gets immediately burned. Uh, so the idea with this is basically to establish an invariant that says it is not possible to call into the account and modify its state without spending at least that amount of gas. And you can check very easily what a uh, kind of guaranteed spend commitment of an account is by basically checking the code of its account uh, for a prefix, right? And a prefix basically is just like push three, some number from zero to 16 million uh, and then uh, commit. So uh, now you might notice uh, that um, spend uh, commit, uh, commit, this is a slightly different presentation from the presentation that was in the current kind of EIP that was published a couple of weeks ago. There has been some discussion since then. Um, and one of the discussions is basically like for, um, this is the kind of the longer term version of abstraction instead of doing a, instead of doing a kind of consume gas and refund thing at the end, have a, com um, have a commit. Uh, but we'll see very soon uh, kind of what this commit does, right? So first of all, accounts that are targets, so accounts that are expect or expected to represent end user accounts are generally are going to have this commitment. And so they're going to just self declare what their minimum guaranteed gas spend is. Uh, pay gas, right? So pay gas, basically, the idea here is that pay gas is equivalent to the current uh, gas payment logic. Um, Basically, pay gas is a special opcode that can only be called in a top level execution context. And it takes as input two stack arguments, right? One is the gas limit, and the second is a gas price. And it immediately spends at that amount of way. And if there's not, not that amount of way, then uh, the uh, uh, transaction fails and it's invalid. It reduces the remaining gas in the execution context to the gas limit minus the amount of gas that was already consumed. And then uh, and if that amount is negative, the transaction is obviously invalid as well. At the end of the transaction execution, um, if the uh, if execution fails, it, it reverts only to the end of the pay gas, right? So if the execution fails, then everything that happened before the pay gas still, uh, pat, uh, still like the state changes are still saved. The gas payment is still, itself is still saved. Um, and then the refund is basically the gas remaining multiplied by the gas price and then the rest goes to the miner as a fee. So you might notice that this is the exact same logic that currently exists uh, that's kind of hard coded in as part of a transaction processing, right? So transaction processing basically says, step one, check the nonsense signature. Step two, spend this amount of waste. Step three, do the execution. Step four, do a refund. Um, here, we basically take that step two, take that logic, and instead stick it into the pay gas opcode, right? So calling the pay gas opcode acts as a logical separator between verification execution, which is what happens before, and kind of other execution, which is what happens uh, after. Uh, if some failure happens during verification execution, then the transaction is just either invalid or it doesn't pay a fee, so it cannot be included at all. Uh, but then if uh, execution, um, uh, if some uh, like out of gas or except some other exception happens after the pay gas, then it reverts back until the pay gas, right? So basically it reverts only back until 
after the verification execution and after the transaction fee was uh, paid. So banned operations, this is the really important piece. Uh, so this is things that you cannot do during verification execute, uh, code execution, right? So this is things that you cannot do before paid gas. Uh, one is reading balance, and this means including reading your own balance. Um, the, another is any external call or any external storage read, uh, with one narrow exception to allow delegate calling libraries that are guaranteed to not go away. And the third is reading environment, environment variables like number and timestamp. Uh, so the purpose of this, right, is to basically say that pre-pay gas um, ex uh, execution, so execution of the verification uh, uh, code can, can all, well, by the way, I should clarify, verification code is not like separate code. I'm, I just mean the portion of the code that runs before the, before the uh, transaction hits the pay gas opcode. Uh, so the idea is that execution before the pay gas opcode can only depend on the state of uh, that of the target account, right? So you cannot call out. Uh, and so, and the reason why we do this is to establish a hard guarantee that says that if some account is modified, then the only transaction that transactions that need to be reprocessed are transactions that are actually targeting that account, right? So, if I have a transaction that targets some account X. Uh, but then some other account Y gets modified, my transaction does not need to be reprocessed because I know that the execution that all, that's um, up to and including the pay gas only depends on account X, it does not depend on account Y, and so there's no reprocessing required. Uh, the reason you cannot even read your own balance, um, so this uh, gets into uh, um, the spend commitment stuff and like why this exists, right? Basically the challenge is, so, the invariant that we're going for is that we want a uh, transaction. What we want it, we want it to be difficult for uh, to uh, modify an account in, and uh, in such a way that it makes uh, the uh, transactions uh, going from that uh, from that account need to be reprocessed. Right now, obviously, if you have a transaction from account X, then that's going to potentially interfere with or invalidate other transactions from account X. Like be, well. At the very least, if you have an account that works sanely, then a transaction is generally going to invalidate itself, right? Because, like you, can, you don't want to be able to include the uh, same uh, transaction twice. But another thing is that you don't want it to, like, you don't want it to be easy for some execution that happens somewhere else in account Y to modify account X and then cause uh, account X to be uh, to have to be reprocessed as well, right? So, like for example, you could imagine an attack where you basically, someone goes and checks and sees what are all of the targets of the mempool, and then they just do an attack that says they just do like one call into all of the accounts that are in that mempool, and they basically just, uh, every one of those uh, calls is going to cost like only, well, right now 700 gas after EAP 2929, 2200 gas, but it's still, uh, still too little. Uh, and so they're going to for basically make some mod potentially make some modification to all of these accounts, and they're just going to force you to reprocess like tens of thousands of uh, transactions in the mempool. This would be terrible, right? And so what we do instead is well, first of all, uh, the reason why we ban reading the balance is because we w we want it to still be easy to send uh, uh, ETH to other people's accounts, right? We want it to be easy to just send a bit of weight to someone, uh, but um, in order for that to not be a vector to force mempool, the mempool to be reprocessed, we basically just ban reading the balance, right? And so, uh, and so the only way in which the, a transaction can depend on the balance is basically that uh, the pay gas opcode would check if there's enough money, and if there's not enough money, it would fail. And sending someone money cannot make a, a formerly in, uh, valid transaction invalid, and so that's not something we have to worry about. Now, Getting to spend commitments in the six times and thick, right? Basically, what's going on here is um, that let's say you have an account and transactions uh, from that account um, are take, like, say, 90,000 gas to uh, get to the point where they call pay gas. We want, to, uh, in order to protect our invariant, we want to have a mechanism that says, well, account X cannot be modified unless 
15,000 gas at least gets burned in order to do so, right? So if someone is willing to burn the 15,000 gas in order to call into the account and potentially modify it, then fine, we can reprocess. If they're not willing to do that, then you know, they, cannot, they can't call, uh, uh, call into the account at all. Uh, so what this, so, uh, and then if you imagine like all accounts uh, kind of having this restriction, right, then basically uh, what you can see is that, well, if you receive a block and that block contains a bunch of transactions, then those transactions are going to cause a bunch of state changes. But we know uh, that if they cause a state change to an account that is a target, then that uh, basically um, every um, for every uh, kind of n gas of uh, reprocess, like if that if that target has some transaction that does uh, that's going to require n gas of reprocessing, then modifying that target is going to require burning at least n over six gas. Uh, there's only twelve and a half million gas in a block, and so the maximum amount of uh, reprocessing that you can do altogether is only going to add up to seventy five million. I'll probably stop here for just a bit uh, in case uh, people have questions because this, this is probably the most involved part of uh, the entire proposal, kind of how the invariants work and why the thing's safe and why reprocessing is bounded. I know I've got a few questions, um, sure. but they were actually related to earlier parts. Um, this actually makes a great deal of sense. I mean, the, so that you can um, do a trial execution of it in the mempool to make sure it's valid, but then not wanting to then later find out it's invalid and having to turf it out. So mm -hmm. essentially not having the problems that Hyperledger Fabric has of putting a transaction in the blockchain that's then later found to be definitely invalid um, mm -hmm. just due to some simple things. Um, yeah. Does anyone have questions about um, this this area? Hmm. Everyone. I have a it. question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question on how the number six was chosen. Why mm -hmm. six? And is just arbitrary, or is there a specific reason? Um, it's just it, it's just arbitrary. I mean, I I, I guess like. If the number was like say 100 instead of six, then the amount of reprocessing that you have to do would potentially be really high. If it was like say one instead of six, then basically like the the problem uh, would would be that uh, well um, that it would just like there would be a lot of uh, legitimate use cases that would be needlessly expensive. I actually think that like it could potentially be reasonable to make the number be even smaller than uh, even smaller than six. Like even two or three could be safe as well. It's just a, a safety trade-off. Okay. But isn't it, isn't it the other way around that makes it less safe? Like if you increase the amount of validation gas per gas on chain? Uh, yeah, well, it, it absolutely becomes less safe because okay, yeah, means that yeah. The, yeah, the, the reprocessing becomes really um, expensive. Like after a block, you might have to do a huge amount of gas of uh, re reprocessing to check okay. if the mempool is still valid. Yeah, so, so were you saying that um, we might need to lower the number to make it safer or we might be okay to make it higher? Um, I guess uh, my personal instinct is that um, and core devs tends to be overworked and tired and scared of uh, the radical things. Uh, uh, justifiably, and so unless there's a legitimate reason to make the number greater than six, we should keep it to six. And, and unless someone can come up with a legitimate reason to make the number greater than three, we should probably decrease it to three. Um, kind of start conservative and uh, go up from there. Um, I guess one thing about six is that six is like a reasonable ratio between the theoretical minimum uh, gas consumption that you need to do something reasonable uh, kind of within a block and to the uh, amount of uh, gas consumption that you would need to do like a fairly significant verification in a multi-sig wallet. Mm -hmm. So um, I th think Will um, Villan Villanueva uh, had a write-up from Quilt on S like how the current nonce and uh, signature verification um, gas or theoretical comp like 
The equivalent amount of gas to do that verification is related to how much gas on chain is required to invalidate it. So um, I can put the link to that in, in the chat if anybody's interested in some of that work. Perfect. Well, that actually relates to a question that I was going to fire through because you're saying that the maximum that you can spend in a contract is 400,000, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the um, verification contract. So then um, suddenly we're, you know, you could imagine then that every transaction is using 400,000 gas just to verify. Mm. Um, so how does that compared to say the ECDSA, um, you know, EC recover sort of verification of addresses and right. are we now moving a whole heap of processing on chain uh, mm -hmm. and you know, doing more that we, than we previously needed to? Yeah, uh, good question. I think uh, so for like in terms of how that compares, like ECDSA, like I don't think everyone is going to be doing 400,000, right? Because like people don't want to have their transactions cost 400,000 gas. Um, like in terms of how it compares, ECDSA verification is, I guess, comparable to somewhere between five and 10,000 uh, gas worth of um, execution. Like I personally expect most users to just be using a multi-sig or doing Schnorr or whatever. So it'll cost like maybe like also in the, like, you know, 10 to 50,000 gas range. Um, but in practice, like, it does mean that a transaction is going to potentially cost uh, like up to 40 times more uh, to process when it enters the mempool. But at the same time, like, I don't think that should be interpreted as a factor of 40 increase in load. Um, and the reason basically is that like, well, if someone publishes uh, that kind of transaction, like basically if someone publishes a regular transaction today that corresponds to on average around like, you know, 50 or, or 60,000 gas of execution, uh, whereas if someone does one of these 400,000 uh, gas transactions, then that's going to correspond to at, at least 400,000 gas of execution and uh, po uh, possibly even more. And so just the number of heavy transactions that can happen is going to be lower than the number of uh, transactions that exist today. And so that all kind of uh, counteracts the, the effect somewhat. Yeah, okay. Okay, when I guess continue, right? Uh, so uh, kind of why the rules, right? Um, and this is uh, uh, like, we've basically gone through this at this point uh, of, you know, pay gas is the logical separator between verification and um, execution of what the transaction is actually trying to do. If an execution reaches pay gas, then no matter what happens after the pay gas, the miner knows that it's going to pay, it, it will pay for gas. And so that's why uh, the miner or the block proposer only needs to verify up to the pay gas to verify that a transaction will be paying. Um, pre pay gas activity cannot read or write to accounts other than the target. Uh, it only depends on the state of the target. And it's modifying an account cost and gas. And so, and uh, modifying accounts can only lead to at most six times and gas of re-verification. And so you have this wonderful uh, kind of six to one invariant. Um, notice that unlike previous versions of EA, uh, where like, for example, in previous versions of um, account abstraction, um, you would just have a hard rule that says accounts cannot be modified from the outside. They can only be modified by uh, uh, transactions that go directly into them. This version of account abstraction allows external calls into an account abstracted contract, which I think is awesome. Uh, and this is actually necessary if you want something like Tornado Cash to be account abstracted, for example. Um, so I guess um, the last uh, kind of question here is, uh, are there alternatives to uh, this approach? Uh, and I think there's two major families of alternatives, right? One family of alternatives is, well, instead of doing pay gas, uh, we would uh, kind of have a bit more kind of stylistic complexity for the sake of uh, having less transition complexity. And we'll actually say that there is a, a special type of account called a, tar a, a target account that has a distinct execution code and verification code. Um, and uh, the verification code um, it, it just basically would be the same as the kind of what I uh, talked about in this slide where we talked about signature abstraction, except the verification code would also have the ability to access storage and it would have some other kind of limited powers, right? Uh, so 
if we do that, um, th uh, and then the transaction would just be two calls. First, verify that if the verification succeeds, I would execute. And this is like potentially, it's like both, con it's like conceptually simpler in terms, like the tr in, if you look at it from the perspective of what the transition is, but I would argue it's conceptually more complex if you look at it from the perspective of like what is the system if you look, if you look at it kind of from scratch. Um, so it's like another alternative. And then the second alternative is to just don't bother with account abstraction at all at the base layer and just implement account abstraction and rollups. And rollups are nice because kind of simple dumb account abstraction where you just, you don't do any pay gas, you don't do any invariance, and you just rely on the sequencer of the rollup to brute force the transaction validity is uh, much easier to implement. Uh, and so like the theory would be that if, uh, the users are going on to the rollups anyway, then you know, you'd be able to kind of get uh, get much much of the benefits there. Uh, so I think these are probably the two most natural alternatives to trying to get the uh, uh, to get the benefits of account abstraction uh, in Ethereum. Uh, but one thing that I would say though is that I think even in a rollup centric world, uh, base chain account abstraction still has value. Um, one, I mean, one value is just kind of philosophical cleanness value, like, especially in the really long term, you know, when uh, we uh, eventually quantum computers are going to start breaking things and we want to have a uh, quantum proof, uh, uh, like everything on chain. And so it, when that happens, we don't want to have enshrined DCDSA verification, right? And so we may want to just have like a kind of abstraction on the base chain so that signing algorithms can move to something else. Uh, and then the other reason is that um, account abstraction can be potentially good for making rollups work better. And the reason here basically is that if you imagine a design where you allow multiple sequencers and so sequencers could potentially interfere with each other, then you don't want to have the risk of uh, two transactions from two sequencers uh, kind of both getting included on chain and one of them having no effect and the other, but, the, uh, but still having to pay gas. And so, if you just have an account where the verification code just like does the checking and it checks uh, basically does the provided pre-state actually equal the post-state in the contract, then you could make uh, kind of on-chain rollups of, uh, of uh, certain kinds that uh, still significantly easier. Uh, so again, like in terms of like what account abstraction is and uh, kind of how it works and what it can, uh, Kind of what it can be used for, I guess. So that like, that's pretty much it. Uh, in in terms of uh, implementation and uh, kind of where we go from here, I uh, I, mean, I imagine, and like I personally think that kind of despite the existence of uh, these old uh, these alternatives, like I think uh, the fact that like. I mean, account abstraction is going to be implemented in rollups anyway, um, and so that's fine. But you know, there, like, I do think that pushing forward on uh, coming up with something um, at uh, and implementing something at the base chain layer is still a yeah, val valuable thing to do. And again, in terms of like, do we would we want to instead try this verification code approach? I mean, maybe we could, but like, the benefits either way are not too large, and and in my own perspective is that the current approach seems fine. And so I, like, I personally would favor just like continuing with how things are now, seeing if we can like try to do a test net, um, try to actually have um, some account abstracted wallets, uh, kind of see how it goes and, um, um, and go from there. Uh, but I guess uh, we'll see. Hmm. Great. Um, I guess, uh, I don't know, if people have more questions, I'm uh, happy to answer them. Will this be deployed on uh, ETH 1.0 or is this only for ETH 2.0? I guess, again, those two are ultimately kind of the same thing, right? Because you know, there's ETH 1.0 ETH is going to keep evolving and then ETH 1.0 is eventually going to become part of the ETH 2.0 chain. Uh, so. I definitely favor like, trying to just get it into ETH 1.0 so we uh, get the benefits sooner. Great. Um, I'm just going to post in the chat one more time about inherit.cash. I definitely mm -hmm. think that inherit.cash is a, is a good use case for this. I don't have an audit yet, but 
you know, if you want to take a look, uh, it's, I think it's really cool for someone that wants to be able to leave an inheritance to their beneficiaries, whatever form, shape that might be. Mm-hmm. All decentralized. Show King. Thanks so much for your guys' time and your attention. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've got a another question. So, um, with the Pegasop code, it sounds, and the idea of the contexts, it feels like, um, so we've got a new concept within the EVM, you know, so mm-hmm. you, um, yeah, and I guess as well, you've, these contracts, or at least the function call within the contract that does this pay gas is now going to be essentially a very special function call. So you can't, you know, call it from another bit of code on the, um, out there. So, yeah, I'm just thinking it through. So that, that so it's a new app. Yeah, so you're not going to be able to call it from one contract into this. It's mm-hmm. from an EOA only, essentially. I mean, not not enforced, but if you if this was the second thing that um, actually could you call could you have a contract which calls into this and so ha- use two contracts two function calls to do this sort of account verification? Like do two function calls where one function call does the verification and the other function call does execution. Um, I I definitely expect that sort of thing to be a common template. Um, Right. I guess this is the other kind of third alternative to a kit. Uh, like, I mean, this is not as much of an alternative because it requires smaller changes. Uh, but the idea would basically, the alternative is basically that instead of having more complicated logic, we would basically just have more templating logic. And then templating logic basically requires you to do, to like do one delegate call uh, in order to, that does verification, then call pay gas, and then do one delegate call that uh, does execution. And then to just like figure out how much to uh, how much to pay the miner at the end. I, that's definitely another alternative. I guess that would just have less complexity at the consensus layer, but there would still but you know you would have more complexity in terms of like implementing the template and actually che- uh, and uh, actually checking the template. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think like both are potentially reasonable. I do have another question, but I'm conscious that I've asked a few questions. Uh, I, does anyone else have questions? Yeah, I would like to throw in a, a quick one. Um, Vitalik, with the changes that uh, you're proposing here, uh, you're touching on some of the very fundamentals of uh, how Ethereum works, uh, like the DOS protection from the simple idea that every transaction has to pay for gas and that there, by definition, therefore can be no spam. Um, And I'll admit that the changes here, uh, messing around with these fundamentals, makes me a bit uneasy. Um, Mm. What is your view on how secure is Ethereum uh, with these changes here? I mean, I guess it does definitely kind of dig into the fundamentals. I don't think that it breaks core invariance, right? Like, because... Like it does, it tries really hard to preserve the core invariant that like, for example, there's only a limited amount of execution that can happen before you know that the, that a uh, transaction is going to be valid, right? Which is uh, probably the, mo- the, probably the most important one. Um, so I do feel like we, like I, there is, like there is, I guess, some uh, kind of inherent risk that just has to be done. Like if you want it to be possible to run code before verification at all, but I, I, I don't know, like I personally feel like within the scope of that requirement, there's like already sort of all of the guardrails that we can put. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Attempt, is there any attempt to? Uh... Uh, model what the impact would be on sort of mental processing with all of this reprocess- reprocessing. Uh, there was, I think, uh, there was a there was an ETH research post that got uh, that got linked in the chat. Um, it was seven nine three seven. Yeah, th- that was against the earlier prototype of our implementation of AA. Um, if we need more solid numbers, we can always update it to the current EIP and rerun the numbers too. So, mm-hmm. so 
the EIP 86 came out like in 2016 or maybe it was even 2015, so a long time ago. And, you know, that didn't get up. And I think there have been a few other iterations of it. And now we're up to, you know, the latest iteration. Why do you, th you know, what has stopped account abstraction being adopted earlier? And why do you think it will be adopted now? I think realistically the answer to that is the same as the answer to why Ethereum development is in general has uh, kind of not done too many things in the last couple of years. And now things like 1.x are picking up uh, really quickly now. I think it's just uh, there weren't many resources to do radical things before, I guess. And, uh, you know, like there were a lot of things that we wanted to do from the beginning, right? Like we yeah, wanted to change from the hexary tree to the binary tree. We yeah, wanted to add a, uh, a history Merkle tree, uh, we we'll, we'll wanted to do uh, some, a lot of different things. And all, I think all of those things have uh, kind of stalled for a couple of years. And now uh, things have really rapidly changed over the last uh, year or so. And there's uh, dedicated teams for each one of them. So I don't really think it's an account abstraction specific thing. I think it's more a kind of core dev process thing and the core dev process has improved. In your alternative slide, um, you mentioned how, you know, uh, how sequencers are used could help make um, account abstraction easier. Could um, you, you recap that? Uh, sure. Uh, so basically the um, idea there is uh, that the way a roll-up works, right, is that you have this one party called a sequencer that just collects transactions that are going into the roll-up and then the sequencer verifies them and uh, puts them into a batch uh, and then publishes the batch. And the sequencer, um, the, uh, like basically transactions just get sent to the sequencer directly, right? So there's not, like, there's not even a mempool, there's just like one mem node. Uh, and the sequencer can even run a much simpler algorithm because their algorithm is just receive a transaction, does the uh, transaction pay gas or not? Um, if, it does, if it does, then accept it. And if it doesn't, then throw it away. Uh, and so they only actually really need to process every transaction once, which is uh, just amazing, right? And, uh, and so, because, well, and, and actually if they want, they could even go further, right? Because you could even do uh, transaction fee payments like, as not as part of the transaction. You could have them do, be done as a like, part of a channel payment going to the sequencer, for example. Uh, and so you have a lot more flexibility with a sequencer-based approach than you have with a yeah, net, a kind of traditional ETH1 style network approach. Um, and I think that just uh, ends up leading to, uh, well, it leads to a lot more flexibility, right? Because you just need to worry much less about the possibility of DOS transactions. Okay, I guess, I guess part of my question is, is there, um... Yeah, I might be missing something about sequencers, but is there something in them that just makes them less um, attackable to DOS or does it just push the problem kind of to the sequencers too? So. Right, uh, so I think there's two answers and one of them is like, it's just the fact that it's only one node that's uh, processing these things instead of uh, tens of thousands of nodes. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is um, that, a, Real, the sequencer is expected to be a more powerful and more sophisticated node. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for those two points. It still sounds a little bit like though that, um, yeah, they, they will have to, you know, yeah, they could be open to attack. So it's right. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. The third thing that I forgot to mention is uh, channel payments, right? So like, I think yep. <coughs> I yes. believe optimism is doing this. Like they don't even have payments uh, as part of a transaction. You just like, subscribe to the sequencer and like prepay for like, some amount of gas. Um, yep. Or, yeah. or like to, to, um, or to use a roll up or a sequencer, you'd have a balance already in them. So if they, if you send a bunch of, um, attack transactions, they could always probably withdraw from, from that initial balance. Right. Mm, maybe like you, they would still have to prove, uh, Oh, I see. Right. Like it's kind, kind of like in a state channel, how, you know, you already have a balance in, in it. Right, right. Like to use a roll up, you might already have a balance. Yeah, there, potent right? well, 
Potentially, yeah. Um, right, I guess the other thing is that, uh, like, as I mentioned, the concept of reprocessing doesn't exist, right? Because the sequencer's algorithm is just like, receive, try to process if it's, uh, if it's fine, immediately include it. If it's not fine, then just like, ignore it. Drop it, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, maybe flip to the last slide and I'll talk about the forthcoming talks. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and I'm back on the call as well. I dropped off the call temporarily, but I'm back. Um, anyway, so in two weeks time, um, we have got Dominic Schmidt and he's going to give us a talk on Raiden and explain what Raiden is and how it can provide scaling. Um, and then in four weeks, we've got Alexei is going to give a talk on TurboGeth and talk about um, why he thinks TurboGeth is the bee's knees and the best um, Ethereum client ever and 10 times faster, bigger, brighter, better. Um, and Constantine, in two more weeks' time from then, is going to give a talk on scale, um, which is another um, scaling solution. And then in two weeks after that, we'll have a talk from um, one of the people from Filecoin or David and I will give a talk based on our work on Filecoin. Um, so Dominic um, is in Germany, Alexei is in London and Constantine is in the Ukraine. So um, hence the talks are gonna be Brisbane afternoon. Um, the Filecoin talk, um, if it's one of the people from Protocol Labs, then it will be probably 9 a.m. Brisbane because they're in San Francisco. Or if David and I or I do the talk, we'll do it at 12.30 Brisbane. Um, yeah. So are there any final questions? Okay, looks like it's all good. Well, thank you again for um, coming along and giving the talk, um, Vitalik. Um, I'll post the video um, onto the YouTube channel and if people have got further questions, maybe they can put comments in the, against the video and um, yeah, people can um, work, work through those later on. Um, so thank you, thank you for joining. Yeah, congrats on getting it to this point, Vitalik. Thank you all for Thanks listening. All. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Love your work.